<laughs> okay. Thanks for joining us today for our Small Acres webinar on alpacas and llamas on small acreages. My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm the Small Acreage Management Coordinator for the Front Range here in Colorado. And sitting next to me is Pat uh, Alger, who is a llama and alpaca owner, and she'll be doing our presentation today. But before I hand the mic over to her, um, I'd like to thank our sponsors for today's webinar, Llamas Colorado. You can check out their website for more information about them. And I'd also like to thank Colorado State University Extension and the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service for making this webinar possible. Sitting in front of me, who you can't see, is Ruth Wilson. She's our IT specialist for the day. So if you're having any problems, you can use your chat box on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen to interact or correspond with us, and hopefully Ruth can help you out. Um, the chat box, if you're new to webinars, is a place that we'll be able to communicate with each other. So throughout the presentation, if you have questions or comments, you can just type them in there, hit enter, and we'll communicate in that way. Um, Pat would like you to hold, or Pat will answer questions at the end of her presentation. However, if you want to type your questions in while you're thinking about them, that's fine. But just know that she'll wait till the end to, to answer or address all the questions. One more thing before we get started, I'd like to ask Ruth to um, bring up our uh, poll questions. So just so we can get to know our audience, looks like we have eight people on today. So we have a small audience, but just so we can learn a little bit more about you. Um, so I'll give you a few minutes to use your mouse and click on the appropriate answers. All right, so it looks like we have just about even, just considering, and one to five years experience, and extension agents, or NRCS. Perfect. So a whole range of folks then, Pat. Wonderful. And some knowledge as far as knowledge about llamas and alpacas. Good. Thanks for that. So I'll ask Ruth, I guess, to pull up um, the presentation and hand the mic over to Pat. And just a reminder, this webinar is a prerequisite to the small acreage livestock uh, workshop that's going to be on October 15th. And we can talk about that at the end. So here you go. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending today. It's going to be uh, very informative, I hope. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to ask, because I can certainly answer anything that you um, need taken care of. Um, today, I'm, we're doing the alpaca and llamas. It's a sustainable livestock. Um, kind of a brief history of how I got into um, alpacas and llamas is that we live on a family farm that we've had in the family since 1895. Um, my folks showed up one day and asked what about alpacas, if we'd like to raise them, and I had no clue whatsoever. So we started investigating and getting into it and started visiting farms. And 12 years later, here we are. Um, we started with four bred females and just continued raising them from there. We do sell alpacas. Um, we sell the far, raw fiber, yarn, rovings, finished product. Um, I'm also a 4-H leader for Larimer County. We do the, uh, uh, the Alpaca Llama Project. I'm a resource leader for that as well. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I don't think we'd be doing it, or if we were doing any other kind of livestock, I don't think we'd be in it today, just because we really do enjoy the animals. Um, even the little kids love them. The history and background, um, it's, it's rather interesting how alpacas and llamas came to be in the United States. Um, they are members of a camelid family. They've been domesticated for over 6,000 years. Uh, they, they grew up in the Andes Mountains, specifically Peru, Bolivia, and Chile. Um, 
and they have lived there for millions of years before being domesticated. The neat thing about it is um, they were actually in North America continent during the Eocene epoch, which ended um, 33 million years ago. If we trace it back, there's a fascinating fossil record from across North America, from Florida to Southern California to Oregon, and even to Alberta, Canada. Um, as I say, they were domesticated over 6,000 years ago. And only the Incan royalty were allowed to uh, wear the alpaca and the llama um, fiber. The, uh, they actually started importing animals, the al alpacas, um, in 1984, but they stopped in 1988 so that the um, American or the, the United States alpaca could, could increase and not continually import the animals. If you notice here, there are, here's a, a picture of a llama and an alpaca. It somewhat shows the difference. Um, llamas, when their ears are erect, they look like bananas, whereas the alpacas are straight up and down. Um, there's also llamas fully grown range anywhere from 300 to 400 pounds where an alpaca is anywhere from 100 to about 150 pounds. Um, in the presentation, if I refer to an alpaca, it also, since I raise, mainly raise alpacas, I do have llamas for guard as well. But um, it's referring to both since they are cousins um, and it, they are, as I say, part of the camelid family. Um, there are two different breeds of alpaca and llama. There's the wakaya and the surrey. The average lifespan of these animals are 20 plus years. The facilities, um, you can have an alpaca ranch or farm on as little as one acre and obviously as many acres as you want. Um, it just kind of depends on your uh, resources. The fencing. Um, fencing is critical to the, the layout is critical. Um, you want, you can get as ex inexpensive fencing or as, as uh, expensive fencing as you as you want to go. Um, it's really entirely up to you and your budget. When setting up your pins, um, you need to think ahead of, of how you're going to clean up your poop, mow the grass if you have if you lay out grass um, and the movement of animals between pins. Uh, for instance, if you have a small tractor to clean up poop, you need to ensure that your plans include big enough gaps for the tractor, but small enough to move animals without a hassle. Um, it's, a, it's a good idea. You need to have shelter for the animals to get in and out of the weather. However, I've, my animals tend to stay out in in the weather, since they did come from the Andes, um, we tend to uh, baby them and, and put them up at night. I don't do that. As you can see in this next slide, they have access. Um, it's snowing. They can go in or out of the weather, whichever, um, whichever they prefer. Um, it also is a good idea. Um, some people, some farms that ha are in the mountains, um, they do have larger predators than what I do. Um, I've got coyotes. So it is good that, uh, you know, you do have shelter to try and protect them from predators as well.
The nutrition. Obviously, they need fresh water daily. Um, that's a given. We feed them grass, hay, or alfalfa. Um, usually the lactating uh, females and the, and the ones that have lower, lower or underweight animals, we will feed alfalfa. Um, alfalfa has a lot more protein in it than the grass. So that's why we tend to feed more grass hay. The different types of grass hay um, that we feed, there's brome, orchard, there's, there's mixes, there's timothy. Um, it's personal preference. If you can see in the, the one grass picture, this is a, a orchard. Um, and it has wider, broader leaves which the animals tend to like a little bit more. The alfalfa is more like candy to them and they'll eat it quickly. Um, the uh, uh, On the grass, the timothy is, is all right as well. Um, it just has a, a narrower uh, stem. The second and third cuttings are really better from it just because it has less weeds in it, but it can be fed to them as well. Um, grain, there again, it depends on personal preference. Um, some vets say that, you know, you don't need to grain. Um, other vets like it. It could, it just it just can, if you overfeed them with the grain, it could cause an overweight issue as well. Um, but the grain they we tend to feed is either straight corn to spe specifically specifically formulated feed. Um, here's one formulated feed label that um, we use. Um, the protein on it is 15%. The label's not real, a good, real good picture, but this kind of gives you an idea of um, what is put in the, the grain. It helps for uh, maintaining the weight as well. The nice thing about these alpacas and llamas. They're very low maintenance and docile animals. Um, they're just wonderful to be around. They, uh, they, I can't say enough about them actually if you can tell. <laughs> um, they've got communal poop piles. We, we pick up the poop weekly and uh, put it in a, a larger pile to be ground, and then we sell the alpaca manure. Um, the neat thing about it is alpaca and llama poop is more fertile than other types of manure. So um, when they tend to eat weeds because they are uh, ruminants, the, the seeds of those weeds do not come through the poop. It uh, it breaks down and it actually um, makes things that you you feed the, like the trees or your vegetable garden or any garden it just makes it grow bigger um, I had one of my 4-H kids years ago do a study uh, between um, alpaca sheep cow and I believe it was the horse and did did a sample of each one and the alpaca uh, the vegetables that were were fertilized with the alpaca grew much larger and there was no weeds or anything in the uh, in the manure um, we shear once a year either in late spring or early summer and you know it's really unhealthy not to shear the animal because they regulate their uh, body heat by their stomach, and if they get they can get overheated and dehydrated, and uh, you can tell if they're um, 
not healthy as well by the their poop. You know, if it's not little pellets, um, there's something going on with the animal, and it's you need you, we need to get on it right away. So it is critical that the the shearing is they they are sheared once a year. Now some on the Surreys, um, however, if it's a show animal, sometimes the the breeders do not shear those animals, but twice a, or every other year, because of the show ring, and what and when they take these animals into the show ring. Um, but the wakayas, it is really critical to to do every year, just because their fiber is so dense and. Um, thick that they do get, can get overheated. We trim the nails about every six weeks are needed. Um, I have found that the white animals tend to grow faster um, and longer than the colored animals. Um, so we try and we, you know, and we watch that. If my my big males um, that I I've got 35 acres of rocky ground, so I tend not to have to trim theirs every so often just because the the rock grinds them down. Whereas my females um, they don't have quite that option, so we do have to sh um, cut them more often. And they've got nails just like you and I and pads. And if you can see on this other picture, um, it's the the actual pad. This is the pad, and um, it uh, the nail is even or um, even with the pad, and is trimmed back. The teeth, um, if you can see here, these teeth are actually getting a little long. Um, on the top, they just have pads, and uh, if the the bottom teeth grow above the pad, it can impact their new their eating ability, and can uh, cause um, weight issues because they're not eating, and it's and it's irritating the pad. Um, also, they do have fighting teeth. Um, in the back, they've got at least six fighting teeth, if not eight, two on the top and two on the bottom. And so we have to trim those um, when they're, they're young because they become points. And when they're fighting or wrestling with another animal, they tend to grab the legs. And so they can cut the legs of the other alpacas and llamas. So... Um, we trim them so that they're even with the pad. Um, they do have baby teeth just like you and I, so as they get older the teeth will fall out and then you have the permanent teeth. So um, there are different types of things that, um, different kinds of tools that are used. Um, we use a, a, a tooth trimmer which is a, a piece of equipment that slides on the tooth and then it just we push it forward and it trims it. We also have to put ropes in the back to keep their jaw open so we don't catch the pad on the top. Um, there are also um, tools that have the uh, it's like a diamond um, a diamond rope where they'll saw it as well. That does take a little bit longer, and it also uh, you have to water because it heats the teeth up. It's similar to, I guess, floating teeth on horse horses. If anybody's familiar with that, we vaccinate. Um, we deworm them twice a year uh, with ivermectin in the spring and mat panicure in the fall. The ivermectin is usually an injectable, and we do it sub Q. The Panicure is a paste, and it goes right in the mouth. Um, and that is usually, on the Ivermectin, it's 1 cc per 100 pounds, and the Panicure is 5 cc per 100 pounds. 
we do that, uh, as I say, twice a year to to um, keep the worms down because since they are ruminants, they they can um, get you know get worms. We also do the C, D, and T, which is a tetanus, and then an A, D, and E, which is a vitamin shot once a year, and those are usually done, done sub-Q as well. We weigh um, our animals about every month or every other month um, just to kind of make sure that they're maintaining their weight because that's a good indication if the animal gets sick or is losing weight. Um, we body score every couple of weeks or you know as often as we can. I go when I, we go out and feed daily um, I try and just touch the animals to desensitize them um, and get them used to touch you know touching because we do take our animals out a lot in the public especially with the 4-H kids they uh, they tend to uh, uh, we go to nursing homes and stuff like that. So we like to make sure that when we take them out there in good, healthy weight. Um, so I will body score them. You know, and that's why I say every couple weeks to a month, because it may be that I body score one animal one day and and one another. I don't. Um, I don't generally do the uh, every every time I go out and do them all. I, I touch touch them all um, here and there as we go during the week. Um, we do uh, this is the fiber on um, as I said earlier. There's two different breeds: there's the Wakaya and the Surrey. On the Wakaya, when they're fully fleeced, they look like teddy bears. The crimpier the fiber, the more sought after, um, especially when they um, were using them for either for breeding and or for the the fiber shows. Um, it just it the crimpier it are is when you're working with it, it tends to hold together a little bit better, and so that's why they want it uh, crimpier. Also. The micron count between the um, the animals or the is better between a 20 and a 26. The higher the micron, the more dense and um, softer it is. Here's a the Surrey on the the Surrey fiber is much finer than a Wakaya. A fully fleeced um, Surrey looks like string mops. This one, this anim, this Surrey that you see here only has a couple months' growth on it, whereas on the the uh, first page when you saw the Surrey that that had more of a, a year's growth on it. Here's some fiber samples. On the left, you see the Surrey, which you can see it, it's it's wavy, it's longer locks. Um, and on the right is the wakaya, and if you can see in there, you do see the crimp, um, the crimp of the fiber. It, as I say, and and as the animal gets older, the uh, fiber tends to get more coarse um, on them. But you can still use the fiber. There's, um, you can use the fiber for almost anything that you can really imagine. Um, the fiber that I use for uh, the rugs is the neck and the leg. And if it's not nice enough to send for the rugs, I insulate my buildings with it. The insulation factor on those on the um, animals is quite high. It's actually higher than uh, fiberglass. Um, so I've got uh, pictures of product in here that we'll go through um, to show that you can do almost anything with the fiber you you can think of. Um, here's a pair of um, fingerless gloves or or wrist warmers as some people call them. Um, all this stuff is hand done by 
my mom and I, and we go to different venues and, and sell all this uh, product, as well as we do have a farm store that people can come out and purchase the stuff as well. Um, these are uh, felted soaps that I felt around bars of soap. It's alpaca fiber. It's kind of like a loofah sponge um, where you can use it, or if you're going camping, all as you do is rinse it, it, you lather it up, you use it, you rinse it off, you set it on your soap dish, and it dries and it's good to go the next time. I have found with this that the um, soap actually does last longer than just the, a traditional bar soap. It doesn't uh, take as, as much soap. And then the, the fiber shrinks as the soap is being used. Um, so that's kind of cool. These are skeins of yarn. Um, this is dyed yarn that I have dyed. We, I hand dye my, I, my, the, far, the yarn itself. It's usually natural. Um, the interesting thing with alpaca is there's 22 natural colors of alpaca, um, both in the Surrey and in the Wakaya as well. So we've got natural. Um, I do a lot of over dyeing. Um, with some of the darker colors, I variegate or hand paint as well. We do hats as well. There's two different types of hats here. Um, we've got this one up in the right-hand corner is what they call a wet felting process, where it's the raw fiber. And um, we and hot soapy water and we agitate it, hand agitate it to make it stiff, to make it shape into the, the form of the hat that we want. Um, we there again dye our, um, we'll dye the rovings or the, the raw fiber. The picture down to your left is also a felted hat but it's what they call a knit and felted hat where we have knit the the hat and then we throw it in the washing machine and the agitation um, felts it and makes it much tighter. Um, all these hats can be worn really all year round because the fiber is hollow so it breathes um, and doesn't make you sweat and it wicks away the moisture. Um, down in the, the lower left corner here is a shrug that I did on a rake loom. Um, that's another form of, of hand knitting. Um, this is done out of a rose gray uh, fiber yarn. And up in the left hand or the right hand corner is rugs that we have made. We send them to Texas. It's off of our fiber. Um, this is where the seconds and the thirds come in because they they make it into rugs at any length that we would like. Um, the neat thing about the rugs is you treat it just like carpet so you can vacuum it, you can shampoo it. Um, it doesn't uh, break down. And as I say, we can do it in any length. The um, This rug in particular rug is a two by three. And we can have it made in with fringe on the end. Um, it can be done in a Navajo, uh, whatever whatever pattern that we like to have it done in. Um, here's an afghan that was made. There again, it was made off of a rake loom. Um, it's in three different colors. It's a blue, a burgundy, and a black. Um, it's a pretty good sized afghan. It is, it is, keeps you nice and warm in the winter. And then over in the right is a hand crocheted Surrey shawl that was made, um, that we have, ha that I had made, uh, done. So that just gives you an idea on the, the different, things that can be done with the with the fiber um, 
it's it's very versatile and it's just it's wonderful to work with like you tend to if you like to work with yarn um, once you work with alpaca you probably won't work with anything else um, now on to the breeding aspect of the animals they are herd animals so you do need more than one animal um, preferably two alpacas or llamas and you can do an alpaca and a llama they they are housed together um, we can uh, they're very social animals so you do need two of the same sex and there again it kind of depends on on uh, what you're looking at doing getting into the the breeding aspect of the business um, you could get a, a bred female or and a maiden and a gelded male um, that is another option of putting the animals together um, but if you're looking at it starting with breeding you could either start with two females or you know two males um, it just kind of depends upon your budget and your and your preference what your goals are into getting into the business um, males are called herd sires the females are called dams usually um, we start breeding the dams at 18 months and we start using the herd sires at three years of age um, I'm going to go through the dams just and the herd sire so you can a little bit more in depth so you kind of understand um, how we handle it. We start breeding the dams anywhere from 18 months to two years old. Gestation period is about 11 months. Some do run a little longer, which is uh, normal. Some of our animals have not really read the book on knowing that they're supposed to be <laughs> delivered 11 months however the the cycle is every 14 to 18 days um, we do breed them back after they have delivered within the 14 to 18 days so a dam does stay pregnant most of their adult life um, the babies which we call which are called creas they do nurse for six months so you so that's why it's important on the females with the nutrition to keep their um, weight up because they are nursing as well as um, pregnant so they're they're dealing with two two creas at one time um, birth weight generally is 12 to 20 pounds um, twins are possible but are rare um, we do sell both bred females and maidens um, and we do it's kind of fun to to see the the different age spans how they're referred to the Koreas are um, from birth obviously to six months old and then you have a juvenile which is six months to a year you have then what they call yearlings which obviously are years to two years and then you've got the two plus and the three plus age great age categories um, and that's how they do it for shows um, so when you're registering if you want to get into the show circuit you can but the registering for the shows is it goes on birth date uh, birth weight or not birth weight the date of the the birth of the the age of the animal <laughs> it goes on the age of the animal and then um, they also categorize them for the fiber as well um, maidens obviously are are the females that um, have not been uh, bred yet but are of breeding age the herd sires on the other hand they're considered full-grown at three years of age however we start breeding as early as two years old um, if, an, if a, a male looks like he's ready to start breeding and and doing what herd sires are supposed to do um, 
they uh, we start using them early, earlier. If they're not quite sure, we'll wait until they're about three years. And we do um, tend to put them next to a, an older herd sire that knows um, what he needs to do, so that they it, it's a training process, so that they can kind of train and understand um, what what they need to do. We also do cell cell breedings and or herd sires um, as part of our business as well. The fun thing about the, the breeding process is um, we do what they call spit testing. When we have bred a dam to a herd or a herd sire to a dam, they know when they're pregnant after approximately four days to a week. And what we do is we put the herd sire back in with the female and she will spit at that male to um, and that tells us that that she is bred. Uh, and sometimes they will absorb the, the you know the, the breeding so we have to spit test and what I usually do is generally spit test once a month, for about the first three months, or I'm sorry, once a week for about the first three months, and by then, the the dam hopefully has um, retained the pregnancy. They're on occasion where they won't, and we need to re rebreed. But then after that, I usually spit test once a month for the next six months, and by nine months, you can pretty well see that they're um, that they're pregnant and has uh, has retained it. Um, you know they could they could absorb the pregnancy for any number of reasons. It could be that their body's not ready for it. Um, the nutrition might be an issue. Um, you know, so there could be any any number of reasons why they don't uh, they don't return that preg or retain the pregnancy. Um, and sometimes they do abort. Um, I did have a female that, uh, she was a maiden. Um, we bred her three times and she would not absorb. She actually aborted the fetus um, at different stages. And the third time, um, it was really kind of, kind of strange. Um, and it it just definitely tells you they know when the crea is going to be a, a good crea or not. Um, the the third one was um, I had the vet come out and we did a uh, a necropsy and the intestines were growing on the outside, which was really really strange and it baffled the vet. <laughs> but um, so you know, it's just like us. Uh, you know, our body tells us whether it's uh, it's going to be a, a a healthy crea or not. And so they will. E they can either abort or, as I say, um, uh, absorb that pregnancy. And so we just spit test to make sure that they're they're retaining it and and everything is a, a go on it. Oops, sorry. Um, we do castrate the the males if they're not up to our breeding standards. Um, then they come become gelded males and we use them as pets or fiber boys. Um, the the nice thing about the fiber boys is that if we we have we can't castrate or geld before 18 months because they're still um, growing and uh, the castration can take on can cause problems if we if you geld them too early um, the testosterone hasn't been running in through their system for very long or they haven't had to utilize it. Um, so their fiber actually stays a lot nicer if you castrate them 
before you start using them as a breeding animal. Um, then their fiber maintains uh, a good micron count. And yes, as I said earlier, as they get older, it, it will get coarser with time, but it retains that nicer aspect a lot longer. Um, I have included a few slides of the gel gelding process. This actually is one of our one of the her, one of the llamas um, that I use for a guard um, because of because of the predators around that we have. Um, I've got a couple of guard llamas, but these just kind of show the the castration process. This was done at CSU. By the, by the vet students, we have castration days um, twice a year that uh, we bring the animals to as well as, if need be, we can do it on the farm um, as well. So we'll just go through a couple of these. <laughs> So that's my presentation today. Um, this is how you can contact me. Follow us on Facebook or, you know, Timnath Alpaca Ranch. Um, we also have a website that's timnathalpaca.com as well. And um, through that, you can uh, get a hold of me. I do have my phone numbers on the on the website. So I appreciate it, um, everybody joining today. Um, just wanted to, you know, also let you know as well um, that we do have, I will be participating in the seminar that we're going to have in October, and we would love to have everybody join. Excuse me. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Um, Ruth is going to pull up the information on that workshop. Um, next slide. And thank you. So you can go ahead to that website address at the bottom to, to register and learn more about the workshop. And I, I know we were talking earlier about what you were going to be discussing at the workshop, and you said you're going to have an alpaca there. Right. I'll have a couple of alpacas there, do hands-on um, training. To I'll show you how we trim the nails and um, look over the fiber, uh, look at the conformation of the animal, so that, you know, as you do go out and want to purchase, that you kind of have somewhat of an idea prior to purchasing the animal, what, what you're looking at as far as if you want to get into the breeding aspect of it or if you're just looking for pet or fiber animals or and or 4-H animals. Cool. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for that workshop in Boulder. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and take questions, although before, let's ask, I'll ask Ruth to pull up the, the questions for after our presentation just to see how well we did so we can kind of measure our impact um, of our presentation. So just go ahead and answer those quickly, and I'll give you a few seconds to do that before we turn to question and answer. All right, so I'll have Ruth pull the chat screen up large so we can look at some of your questions. Looks like Barry already has a question. Once you've sheared, where do you send your wool to be processed into yarn? Well, there's quite a few actual um, fiber mills around the, around the United States. Nice thing is there is one here locally. It's in Kiowa. It's Spring 2 Fibers. Um, that's where we send the majority of our um, fiber to be processed, and we usually get we get it processed into yarn, we get it processed into bats, and we get it processed into rovings, and then they send it back. Um, there's you know mills, there's a mill in Kansas, um, there's quite a few back east. Um, so if you just go on and and uh, look and see where you're centrally located, if there's some place closer to you uh, that would be more feasible. We have used a couple different ones around the, the, we've used the one in Kansas, and we've used, there's one in Utah that we've used. 
Um, but we do exclusively use the one in Kiowa, Spring 2 fibers, because we just, we really like the way that they um, process our, our fiber. Ranchway Feeds asks, uh, why do you have to wait for males to be three years old before you breed them? You don't have to wait for three years old. That's just when they're more mature. Um, as I said, some we do start using them at two years um, of age and, and older if they look like they're ready to start breeding. If they're not quite ready at three years of age is when they're 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 ready for sure. They're for ready sure, then. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the name of the the fiber play was it spring two spring fiber? two fiber in Kiowa in okay. Kiowa. Um, can you confirm what the arcade of teeth is like on the top plate? Top palate. Or top there palette. are no teeth on the top. It is strictly. It is just gum oh. on the top. Now on the in the back they do have the fighting teeth on the top, but in the front um, the teeth are just on the bottom. Okay. And we'll hang on for a little bit longer. It looks like some people are still typing. How can we find out how to process your own fiber? Well, there's different um, things that you can do. There's um, drum carters. There's hand carters. Um, basically, what how you process the yarn, and I guess I probably should have gone into a little more detail on how we process it. Um, when it goes to the mill, you send it in, you skirt it, which is basically laying it out on a large table, pulling out large vegetation, any little poop pellets that happen to be in there, or anything else that uh, is not fiber. Um, the shears tend to, um, they try and not put the, get the belly hair in the blanket, which is between the withers and the, the hips, the back hips. Um, so you pull out any any guard hair around the edge, or if you've got vegetation or matted fiber, you would pull it out. That's part of the skirting process. And then what happens is if you send it to the mill or if you process it yourself, um, you do need to wash it. And it's washed in Dawn dishwashing detergent. Um, that, that seems to be the best. Um, and you just soak it in tepid water, not war not hot water. And so you wash it a couple of times to make sure you get a lot of the dirt and the vegetation out. And then um, you let, lay it out to dry. And it may take, depends on how much you do at one time, it may take a day to dry. From there, you will take a carter, and that's what they do at the mill. They've got, or I'm sorry, not the carter. They, they dehair it at most mills, but some mills they don't. And that's pulling out the guard hair that uh, protects the fiber. Um, and so you can, you can do that by hand. The next process is then the carding. And as I say, there's different carders. You can either have it done by the mill with a machine, or there's hand carders where you um, take, the, take the fiber and rake it against each other. And what it does is it strengthens, or not strengthens, but it aligns the fiber so that um, you can then go into the spinning process. And um, then you can hand spin it once you've, once you've carded it. Um, you hand spin it. And then you can ply it into different plies. Now there's two ply, three ply, um, and then you can. And as you're spinning it, you can get really thin or what they call lace weight yarn, or you can get to the other extreme, which is called bulky or worsted weight. Um, and then from there, you can uh, uh, make things out of it or sell the sell the yarn as a you know a hand spun yarn so there's a lot of lot of information on the internet um, on where to 
find out how to process it. I will have um, some tools there also at the seminar where you can see the different um, methods of, of carding or you know processing the fiber as well. Cool. I don't know if we have, it looks like some people are still typing here. I know I just kind of have a question or two that I thought of. Um, first, what if someone were interested in getting, you know, raising a few llamas or alpacas, are there any books or type resources that you could kind of point us towards? There are. There's um, a lot of a lot of books. Um, there's also a national organization, which is Alpaca Breeders. Um, it's called AOBA, Alpaca Breeders Owners. Okay. Um, and then there is some regional ones. There's um, Alpaca Breeders of the Rockies, which is ABR. And then there's also some local um, little marketing groups mm -hmm. throughout, you know, the Colorado and the United States. Um, there's a couple. One good resource is alpacastreet.com. They have um, a lot of information on uh, different aspects of the breeding, the fiber, um, and then there are books, you know, in the library and on the internet that uh, gives you a lot more detail and a lot more information. Okay. On it. Um, Pat is still commenting here. I think on the fiber. Do you need a free? Oh, not on the fiber. Um, do I need free choice mineral or salt with my llamas? And if so, what type of mineral? Good question. It is. Um, you can do free choice minerals. Um, there is a, um, now I just had a, <laughs> a block. There's a couple of different. There's um, Cash Laputer is one free choice minerals. I do know Ranchway carries. I believe a, an alpaca uh, free choice uh, mineral as well, which you can uh, get here locally and or um, nationally. There's, I know there's one other one, and I can't think of what the other uh, free choice mineral is, um, but it has um, the the salt in it. Um, some Farms do put out salt blocks, but I don't know how well um, that works with the ant, the alpacas and llamas. Okay. Well, hang on. It looks like maybe some people are still asking questions. Um, I guess while we're waiting, I had thought of another question too. You hear about um, kind of the spitting aspect of, of alpacas <laughs> and, and maybe llamas too. So when do they spit on you a lot or do they just spit at each other and they, when do they spit? They tend to spit more at each other than at you. When you get spit on it's probably because you're either in the line of fire or you are doing something that they they just don't like. It is a defensive mechanism. Um, llamas tend to spit a little bit more than alpacas. However, like everybody, they all have their own personality. My two llamas, they don't spit at all. Um, it just it doesn't bother them when I do it. And it also shows that you know when they tend to spit, it you tend not to work with them quite as much, mm -hmm. and they don't like to be messed with. So the more you work with them and the more um, they get used to you and you get used to them, they tend not to spit. And that's why I take a lot of my animals out into the public because they get a lot of that hands-on interaction mm -hmm. a lot more. And uh, so they, mine tend to not spit quite as much as, you know, I think a breeder who, who doesn't, uh, is not able to, work with their animals quite as much. Okay. Good. So if you're at the workshop in October, you probably won't get spit on. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Pat asks, did you have to do any training to get your llamas to guard? You know, no, um, I haven't had to. 
Um, they are, I do know that um, they tend to have a natural ability, I think, to know when a predator is around. And they do a high pitch alerting sound. Um, and so they will alert if something, even if, a, if, even if um, my dog goes with us to the back, to, to the, where we go feed a lot, if he gets rambunctious, um, they start getting excited and will start kind of rearing up a little bit because that's one way they have taken on a, a coyote is they will rear up and, and pounce on it. Um, but if, I, if someone comes with a dog that they not, not, have not seen before or not used to, they will start alerting because it is something new. And so we don't, I have not had to train my guard, my llamas to guard. I think it's just a natural instinct. Yeah. And I have heard, I've got male llamas, but I have heard that the female llamas are much more aggressive and are, are more protective than the males. Okay. Well, we still have a few more minutes and we're open for questions if you have any more. Um, otherwise, thanks for joining us, and just a reminder that you can sign up for the workshop on October 15th at the Livestock um, page at the CSU Extension Small Acreage Management website. And also our next webinar is on swine production on September 29th. And there's the, the website address for registration. Looks like Pat's still typing a question, or maybe not. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait. Okay, great. Thanks, Barry. And thanks, everyone Appreciate else, for it. joining us. Have a good afternoon.